See, the people, there are people who study the future. And when things go badly in our society, we go back to the tradition of uh, going to people who can predict the future, or at least give us some clues. And such a conference was held in New York City in 1860. A group of futurologists got together. And they tried to imagine what would happen to the city of New York in 1960, 100 years later. And they all had different ideas, but there was a consensus. And the consensus was that the city of New York by 1960 would not exist anymore. Why? Well, what they did, they look at the population growth, they look at how the people were transported, and they came to the conclusion, the realization, that in 100 years, if the population would have grown to the same exponential curve, to move the population of New York around, they would have needed six million horses. And the manure generated by six million horses every day would have been an intractable problem. <laughs> so in 1860, they said the city of New York cannot be lived because of the horse problem. It's a very dirty technology. Moving people around with a dirty technology like a horse is not, uh, it will provoke the decline and death of New York City. By 1900, you Americans, and that's why I'm here, by 1900, you had 1,001 car manufacturing companies in the United States. 1,001. All small, all experimental, in the most unforsaken little uh, rural communities around the country. You had one small, tiny little workshop in Dearborn. And so what happened was that you looked at the problem and you came up with a solution. Took a number, took a number of years, but out of an incredible problem, you saw this unbelievable opportunity. I believe that we are in this phenomenal time in history where we are at the end of the first industrial revolution and poised to start the second industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution was based on fossil fuel and mechanics. The second industrial revolution would be based on renewable resources and electronics. So the challenge is to get rid of polluting transport system like the horse and go into a completely different technology, not only polluting in internal combustion engine, but also uh, polluting with freon technology, um, you know, uh, really dirty industries, which uh, the way we generate electricity, you know, very dirty coal plant and stuff like that. But there is a little bit of misunderstanding here. And I'm a little bit disappointed. You think that the future is about communication and technology for communicating? That's not the future. You know what is the future? The future is to feed, transport, educate, communicate, cure, eight billion people in a sustainable way. So the companies that will replace the smokestacks will be green, but they will be stacks. They will put to shame Detroit for the sheer size of the factory, they will produce the winning technology. They will take us from internal combustion engine to the green transport technology. We have seen nothing. And my point to you is, don't even for a second believe that manufacturing is gone. 
Manufacturing has not started as yet. Manufacturing has not started. Manufacturing is gone. You have given the Chinese obsolete technology. You have given, they cannot afford to have combustion engines. Don't you understand that? If the Chinese would have the same numbers of cars per head of population that you have, there will be not enough fossil fuel now. Now there will be 50 million barrels short. Now, if they will have one car each, that technology is obsolete, is gone. Who is going to create the green technology of the future? Not the government, not university. It will be those poor bastards who are right now in their garages in your communities that you would not spit on them to put them out if they were in, you know, on fire. <laughs> Whatever you have right now, you have right now in your community, the next Sam Walton. Look at this hotel. This was not set up by somebody who invented the combustion engine. This was Amway. Somebody who invented a different way to sell. There is no geography to passion. There is no geography to intelligence. Where the hell was Henry Ford born? Where were your best American presidents born? In tiny rural communities. The only reason why we came into big cities was to become employees. But in 1900, all of, in, 19, in 1800, all of our ancestors were self-employed. So, who is going to create the future? The entrepreneurs. Who are the entrepreneurs? This really upsets me. It really upsets me. Because the word entrepreneurs has been hijacked, has been stolen from us. From us. The real people. The word has been stolen. If you go to the university and you get 20 books on entrepreneurship, there will be 20 different definitions of entrepreneur. Nobody knows who entrepreneurs. No, people don't even know what the word means. Entrepreneur comes from the Latin, intraprendere. An entrepreneur never, ever meant a business person. Nor in Latin, nor in English, nor in French. In the last 100 years, the word entrepreneur is linked to entrepreneurship. Do you know what the meaning of the word Entrepreneur is somebody who has initiative, somebody who's courageous, nothing to do with business. In this room, there are planning entrepreneurs, there are city managers who are entrepreneurs, people who are leaders, people who can do something a bit different. That's an entrepreneur, somebody who can see beyond the horizon, imagine a better future. And what we have created, we have created a friendly environment, a convivial infrastructure called enterprise facilitation, where these people for free and confidence can come and talk to somebody about the dream. And then what we do with them is very simple. We, we say to them, why don't you do what Henry Ford did? And they say, what did he do? Well, see, Henry Ford by age 46 had gone bankrupt twice. Twice, he got some money from some investors, and instead of manufacturing cars for sale, since he was a manic, passionate engineer, guess what he done with the money? Build a sports car for him to race. So the investors cut him twice. The third time, he went and begged yet again this rich guy, Malcolmson, to say, please, please give me the money. This time, I promise you, I will manufacture a car for sales. Malcolm said, you want the money? He said, Henry, the only thing that you understand is making the product. No marketing, no financial management. You see? So we give you the money, the only thing you can do is produce the product. Who is going to do the other stuff? And Henry says, well, help me. Okay. This is the way Malcolmson helped Henry Ford. He obliged Henry Ford to employ one of his men 
the most cantankerous, uh, petty clerk that has been working with Malcolmson in coal mining company. The name of the guy is James Cousins, that became your senator. James Cousins became the financial manager, and then the product, Henry Ford, James and their advisor said, we have no personal, we don't know how to sell it. How are we gonna sell the cars? So they invented the distribution uh, method that is still used now, and they started with 470 distributors nationally. So now, Harry was product, James was finance, and they had 470 distributors. The third time, they made it. What we teach these poor people in your community when they come to us is, listen, nobody ever set up a company alone because no human being has ever been born who has the passion to do it, to sell it, and to look after the money. See, this is what we teach the people in your communities now. Only do what you love, surround yourself with people who love to do what you hate. Form a team. <laughs> and as soon as you tell this to people, they have these revelations and they say, ah, so I'm not stupid because I cannot do the books. No, Bill Gates did not do that. Steve Jobs did not do that, you see? So now we are teaching this very simple methodology, which, by the way, it is so hard for us because we are a small non profit going around the world. We have worked from Mongolia to Ecuador. With a, we, we, talking about technology, we are totally virtual. You know, very few people. We are consulting with m the biggest money companies in the world about how to deal with, com deal with communities, how we empower people. It's very hard for us because, you see, the dominant paradigm on what you do when somebody comes to you, ask for help with a business, the dominant paradigm is to get this guy into a classroom and teach her how to write the business plan. You have to learn how to be an entrepreneur. It's not true. It's bullshit. <laughs> Nobody ever did it that way. If Bill Gates could not start a company alone, why are we trying to teach people to set up companies alone? Who the hell invented? the business plan-based training for entrepreneurs. Are we crazy? No single book of entrepreneurship describes an entrepreneur who learned to do the business plan by himself, went out there, got the money, started the company. It's a fictitious idea of entrepreneurship. As soon as they tell you what they want to do, you ask them, what can you do? Can you make it, can you sell it, or can you look after the money? As soon as they tell you what they miss, you say, would you like us to help you in this community to find the people who can help you? We have an army of retired, white-haired people in our community with the wisdom to sit down next to these young entrepreneurs. Why don't we use them? The beauty about that street, street scape was the small shops there. And those little shops were not Google. They were delicatessen and cafes. So the lady that came with the idea to set up a grocery shop, we help her as well as the social enterprise and the big cooperative and the farmers groups. But what we have learned to do is to capture the passion of people. And if every community in Michigan would be able to set up two, three, four, five new businesses every year, you will be laughing. And out of some of these businesses, you are going to have a, a lady called Helen coming to you because the bullshit says there was Sam Walton that set up Walmart. The reality was, was Sam, Helen, and Helen's daddy that set up Walmart. Stop creating these fictitious, mythical creatures. Go back to the reality of what is happening in America and who has made America. And let's go back and play the game and look at the future with incredible optimism. We are down here, guys. We have a world to conquer. Thank you very much.